I'll be presenting on the SNAP attack pipeline paper today. My name's Josh Stoles. Uh, you can feel free to follow me on Twitter or find me at, on LinkedIn at the link below here. Um, I guess an overarching, the primary motivation for this is 10X has come out with a new uh, platform that supports attack seek at the single cell level. And that's provided a lot of new data that nobody knows what to do with at the moment. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you guys the brief attack seek overview, kind of a one slide prompt, because I know we talked about this before, but what you're measuring is open and closed chromatin. And you have a TN5 transposase that cuts DNA and leaves these primers. And then a piece like this that was in an open chromatin section uh, can later be amplified by either a next generation sequencing machine or qPCR. And what you're eventually looking to see is get peak here and valleys and regions like this uh, that you would consider um, closed access or less accessible um, sequence. Um, the SNP the SNAP attack uh, pipeline kind of kind of in a summary does a couple of things. It's a software package for analyzing single cell attack seek data sets. Um, I'll talk about the computational issues, but it addresses the computational issues, which allows for larger data sets in single cell attack seek. And it describes it as dissecting cell type heterogeneity, but it looks a lot like deconvolution to me. And maybe you guys who know more about deconvolution uh, can, can kind of square me up if I'm wrong. Um, and then just as kind of a one and all, it incorporates a lot of common tools for identifying motifs specific to regulation. Um, and then the really cool thing it does is it performs a pseudo temporal analysis to infer the lineage and trajectory of a cellular state. And I think when I get to the figure, that'll be a lot more clear, but I haven't really seen anybody do that before. Um, so here's the pipeline here and it flows top row, then into second row. Um, the quality control selection is pretty normal. Um, filtering for cells and reads based on some pretty typical quality metrics. Where they kind of diverge from any traditional point at first is in this third step uh, with the dimensionality reduction. So most will skip to here and map all of these peaks. Um, so each, remember, here is a peak, here is a peak, here is a peak and you get something like this in IGV, and then we'll train a neural network over it to eventually try to deconvolute the data. Um, this has major, major scaling issues when you move to single cell because you're moving into tens of thousands of cells and the computational time gets unrealistic. And so people had been scaling back their their data sets, and this seems to have resolved it. What they did is say C1 here that we're looking at. C1 for each certain base pair, I think it was four kilobases they used. This would be zero, 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 and they put a one here, zero, 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 one. And then they use dimensionality reduction. Um, I think it's stochastic, Shoot, I forget the name now, but it's like PCI. Um, to, to get a clustering. After that, they annotate. And only after they annotate do they do the peak calling. Now, just like with a differential expression, you can do differential peaking. Uh, you could see here that C2 is lacking a peak at this region, whereas these two are. And so that might be significant uh, to gene on uh, gene expression. 
getting motif analysis. So motif analysis is kind of a pattern within um, a pattern of DNA sequence, right? And so sometimes that pattern of DNA sequence that is that is open and accessible is what's driving the differentiation here. And so this will, will help to label those and identify those. And if you can identify those, you can identify a transcription factor that binds to them. Next, they can do interaction between RNA and the attack seek. So this isn't necessarily the clearest figure here, but what they're demonstrating is that an attack seek in a promoter or excuse me, the chromatin in the promoter here can downstream affect a, an expression later on. Here is their, their last output, which is the pseudotime analysis, which I can't quite capture in, in this figure, um, but I'll talk about it later. Um, so here's the first result, right? So we have an A here, two uh, dimensionally reduced pictures. And the first one here is labeled for data that is RNA-seq and the other one for attack. And what's really nice is, is these are two independent data sets. And so what's really nice is that uh, you can see how well the two overlap and, and kind of reproduce each other with these clusters. Next, these are labeled um, for, for cell type. And you can see they cluster pretty well. Down here, they've begun to label some of these for regions where, where the chromatin is related to expression. So each box here is a peak related to gene expression. And the ones with yellow in them are considered to be highly, um, or no, it's where a SNP is associated with expression. So in this region, you would have chromatin and an EQTL that are associated with expression. I, I think that's really useful. It's, it's kind of a step further we could take with our differential expression if we get this data. I mean, there's a lot of things we could answer with this. Um, this is the pseudotime graph. So they took an embryonic mouse grain um, and got progenitors, granule cells, and pyrimidal neurons. And what you can see here is what, what is actually driving this differentiation is uh, epigenetic markers and, and spatial signaling. In, in these cells. And so you can do a distance matrix from the granule cells back to the progenitors um, and to the pyrimidal neurons to see where these cells are, each dot here representing a cell, to see how far along that lineage they are and, and the distance between these two, which is really cool. The other thing you can do is you can go in here. So this is the same um, dimensions here. And these are genes. And you can look at each of these and see that diff different points along the lineage, certain genes get turned off and others get turned on. So here, uh, this gene is only turned on in the granule cells and this neurod 6 gene is turned off by, by inferring gene accessibility. Um, next, they work on clustering. So here is a, a pretty typical heat map that maybe I've seen in, in deconvo meetings, where each of these represents a, a genomic element and how many genomic elements are in that region. And then these are the cell types ac across the top. Um, they got a gene ontology call for each, um, each kind of cluster here. And I didn't look into it too much, but I would assume it, it's kind of intuitive and maybe reaffirming 
to their to their cause. This they were able to determine a motif that was driving this differentiation, this, this kind of separation from the other clusters. And there will be multiple motifs, but this is the top one. And you can match that then to a transcription factor, which is really nice because this is telling you a lot, a lot about regulation in these different cell types. Um, up here, up top, they've, uh, they've got two different data sets just to show they could do this in complex tissues. Um, this is secondary motor cortex with um, 55,000 about, and I think the other one's 5,000. This little stop shares in the way. But uh, what you can see is it, it's actually able to cluster them fairly well. And again, we're able to, to use uh, gene accessibility here, B and C are the same graph. And you can again see that some genes are only accessible in some some cell types. Um, this is a wordy slide, but I'll make it quick. Um, so the, the key differences between other software that I found, um, it incorporates a lot of tools. Uh, so this includes the differential attack seat, the upstream analysis, um, as well as the heat map outputs. Um, it identifies cell types in an unbiased manner I haven't seen too many attack seek pipelines that do this kind of deconvolution. Um, this this Nystrom method, uh, which is what I was referring to when they do the zeros and ones, I believe, over where they almost one hot the attack seat data, is uh, is really unique in reducing the CPU time, and then um, it can integrate. Um, attack seek and single cell RNA seek data um, to predict promoter enhancers and pairing relations based on a statistical association. And they did caution that um, they weren't strong associations. But I don't think that's any different than any other kind of in silico analysis. Um, and it's much more confirmation than just one by themselves. Our, the, the clustering approach is, is fairly nice and of what they showed, at least it was fairly clear. And it enables a supervised annotation of a new single cell attack data set based on exi existing reference cell atlas. So I, I think it's good software. And I think uh, moving forward, if we do the multi-omics approach, we will probably use it. Um, just some ideas I had. Um, maybe potential applications we could maybe use this to do almost like what Leo did with Visium, but with a taxi where we have spatial epigenomics and tie differential expression hits to a gene accessibility and Excel type. So I'm always wary of our, our gene ontology and our gene accessibility, but if we had a gene network that was tied to a motif that was tied to open chromatin in the cell type, that would be a lot more concrete. And I think that would be really cool. Um, and I wonder if the attack seek can be combined with the RNA seek um, to give a better deconvolution of the data. I, I didn't see them explore that explicitly but I would have liked it. That's kind of where we are. And uh, thanks for listening. And uh, this was derived from this paper, comprehensive analysis of single cell attack seek data with SNP, SNAP attack.